Alright, so today we're looking at a Turbo XT from 1987 made by a company named Excel. Now Excel was a New Zealand based company that specialised in the import of various computers from Taiwan and this is one of them. And this one arrived to me basically as it came from the manufacturer. There was a little bit of dust inside so I know someone did use it at least for a week or so but it spent almost its entire life in the box. Um, it came with a base configuration of 512k of RAM, two floppy drives, CGA graphics and that was it. Now off camera I did upgrade it to 640k and I've also done a bit of a clean on the floppy drives because they had become a bit dusty. Um, but the machine itself actually runs and there's almost no discoloration, it's quite nice. But one of the first problems I had here is as you can see I've got the original keyboard here and uh, yeah having a bit of trouble with those keys. Spacebar's not working and a lot of those bottom keys didn't work at all. Um, in fact, I actually found that F9 was actually a little bit sticky, which was a bit of an issue. So the first thing we had to do was just open that up and uh, see what we had inside. My first concern was it was going to be Keytronic foam pads, um, but no, it actually turns out to use Omni key switches, which is really nice. Um, I checked the PCB, couldn't see anything wrong. All I ended up doing was giving it a bit of a clean and, and I reseated that IC at the top, you can see there. Um, and that was it. After that, keyboard worked perfectly fine, so we'll just snap the case back on. Um, it was all done with clips. It's about as easy as it gets. I didn't even need a screwdriver to work with this keyboard. I was quite happy with that. And it's been working great ever since. So there's the RAM. You see the two lower banks of RAM is the 64 kilobit stuff that I added to bring it up to 640k. That was relatively painless. Um, on the left, we've got the CGA graphics card, and on the right, the factory floppy controller. Being 1987, all the cards you would have seen in these machines were the short length ones usually. Now one of the first things we're going to do for this machine is we're going to actually give it a pair of hard drives. So for this installation I've decided to go with a pair of Seagate ST225s which were extremely popular in the late 80s. A lot of Turbo XT and 286 era machines were shipping with these drives. Very common, very reliable drives. Um, and for the hard drive controller I've decided to go with the Western Digital XT Gen. This is a very popular controller and I actually really like it a lot because it's got a very good formatting utility built into the ROM that allow also allows you to configure the drive for almost any type of MFM hard drive. Um, which is absolutely fantastic so I never have to worry about pairing drives to controllers so much. So I'm just screwing this guy in. You also notice how clean this machine is on the inside. Now the, as earlier I mentioned that I did find a little bit of dust and the only dust I could actually find was in that PSU fan. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing it must have run for you know a couple of weeks. Um, but inside it's pretty much completely spotless and it's never been cleaned. So There's our two MFM cables there. Um, red to pin one. Always do that. And that's one of the first drives I tried. Now I did actually go through four hard drives in total because I had a pile in the workshop. So. Um, did it do a little bit of debugging? That I, I didn't bother putting all of it in this video because it gets a little bit long. So we're just going to cut that back a little bit. Now this particular drive, this Wang ST225 here, um, actually had a track zero fault. So in the end, I decided not to use it. It had a few too many bad sectors all over the place, and I just gave up. Um, I also discovered on this case that I could remove those front clips there, so I could have nice exposed drive bays. And both the drives I ended up using had black front panels so that worked out quite nicely did just realize there that i needed to slide them in from the front but yeah there you go so there's our 20 pin data cable 36 pin control cable and power going in there and then we're going to move our top drive across and get all that wired up now for the control cable i am going a little bit against the grain here and i'm using the way you normally do floppy drives and that's i've got both drives set to the second drive select position and a twisted end on my c drive so c drive is actually that top drive right there with a twisted cable cool and we're just about ready for a power up now just got those cables on there nice uh, one of the drives i did have to deoxidize the connector so that's one thing to watch out for if you have trouble with the drive make sure those connectors are nice and clean and uh yeah make sure your, your plugs are in good shape um, that does make for some weird adventures. Now, nothing screwed in here, but I'll worry about that later. Now, one of the first things when you power up these machines with drives that aren't matched to your controller is you should expect a 1701 uh, hard drive error. You should expect that because the controller can't talk to the drive yet. Um, and we should see that in a second once I get this machine powered up. Oh, I've decided to be fancy and actually screw them in. I'm just going to bolt them in. I don't think I... Oh, that's actually one thing that I forgot to mention here. Um, so there's supposed to be a little slot in... Um, I don't know how to describe it, but it um, slots into the right-hand side for the drive to attach, and I don't have that, unfortunately. 
So we should get our 1701 error now that we've booted up. There it is right there. Okay, so the first step we have to do now is we actually have to do the low level format routine. And this does two things. I mean, one, this formats the drive um, in a way that the controller can actually read it and write to it. Um, but in the case of the Western Digital XD Gen and some of these other um, late 80s controllers that allowed you to have the dynamic configuration, it actually stores the controller's configuration on the first track of the drive and in the first sector. So you have to use these built in utilities to actually set things up properly. Um, you don't want to use a software tool for drives like this. So GC800 column 5, just the usual stuff here. Now I selected an interleaver 5, this actually turned out to be a bad choice. Um, I should probably do another video on interleave um, at a later date. For this particular machine I did some testing later and I found out that an interleave of 3 was perfectly suitable. And to be honest for most machines of this era, an interleave of 3 actually seems to be the fastest option. That works reliably and then once you start getting into high speed 286s and 386s then you start moving to interleaves of 2 and 1 but now to kick off our format here and through the magic of the internet we're just going to fast forward to the end in a second so you don't have to sit here this does take about 10 minutes or so it does take a while and in this you should just hear a click 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 if you hear any other noises it's probably found either bad sectors or there's something wrong with the drive so format bad tracks, I'm not going to bother because MS-DOS format will find the bad sectors for me anyway. It's just a waste of time in my opinion. Yeah, we'll reboot up. And next thing we have to do is actually create the MS-DOS partition. So this knows where, this is just so MS-DOS knows where to put its stuff basically. Um, some reason also on this reboot it did a RAM test. Uh, so it actually does a hard reboot uh, from that BIOS. Uh, just wait for it to start up. We are booting from floppy now of course so there is things do take a little long but you'll notice our 1701 error has completely gone away now that the controller can see the drive and its configuration so it's not going to throw an error in there. So it's nice. We're just booting up DOS 3 there we go okay let's start up fdisk I'm just going to blaze through this we're just going to create a primary partition of the maximum size and reboot the machine only it takes two seconds, it's like one one enter. And that's it. Reboot. And now we've got a C drive. Just go through the reboot process again. There's always this delay here because the, the hard drive controller has to be I mean the ROM has to be checked against the checksum, it then has to boot the hard drive controller which then has to go and talk to the drive, get its configuration, and then it can pass through. Once it realizes the drive is blank, it'll then pass it back to the floppy drive process, which is going to boot off floppy. Which is what we're doing right here. Do -do 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 -do. There we go. Now then the last step is to do a DOS format on C drive. And it's the same as if you're formatting a floppy disk or anything like that. The slash s uh, copy our system files over so that we can boot off the drive. It'll actually load format from disk first. And yes, proceed with format, and away we go. Now the cool thing with DOS uh, 3 is instead of just saying formatting or giving you a percentage, it actually tells you what head and cylinder it's on. This is going to be actually useful if you've got a drive with a whole bunch of bad sectors, because you'll be able to see where the drive's struggling. So for that original Wang drive, which has actually been removed at this point of the video, um, it was getting stuck on head 1. So obviously head 1 had hit the surface pretty hard at some stage. And through the magic of the internet, we've jumped almost to the end, because you probably didn't want to sit through 615 cylinders again. And once you've done this once, you're pretty good for the next 25 to 30 years. These do need a fresh low level format every 30 years, and I'm pretty sure 90% of them um, in collect well not collectors is probably a bad word, um, but a lot of enthusiasts probably threw those drives out because they thought they were at the end of their life because they started throwing errors, but usually a fresh low level format is all you need. So now I'm just going to reboot and try and boot off the hard drive this time. Um, so we don't want to boot from floppy anymore, I want to boot from the hard drive and make sure that it's all kosher. And there we go, we're just waiting, there we go, and you'll see we've got a C prompt this time instead of A drive. Do a dir, and we've got command.com which is all we need to actually start the machine, and 21 megs free, beautiful. So one of the first things I do when I set up a machine like this is I just use the copy con command. Um, to generate my config.sys and autoexec.bat files, just makes the machine a little bit cleaner uh, when you first start off. Um, there's lots of things you can do here, and people also install menu systems and all sorts of stuff, but this is just my first step. 
So for config.sys, I just leave it empty, control Z, enter, and it just creates a blank file. It's just going to stop it from asking for the time and the date every time I turn on the computer. Um, for autoexec.bat, first line's echo off so it doesn't repeat all the statements on the screen. Then CLS to clear the screen. And prompt $p $g, that's going to give us our nice C colon backslash little arrow thing that everyone's familiar with. I'm also going to set the path to C colon backslash DOS because we're going to install DOS there. And when I type DOS commands, I don't want to have to type C colon backslash DOS in front of every single one of them. So I want it to look in that directory by default if it can't find something. Next, I'm going to display the DOS version. It's just a nice touch. And that's it. Cool, so I'm going to make do called DOS because we're going to install DOS next. Now I'm already irritated at this point by the fact that my prompt doesn't have the directory in it. So I'm just going to test out my auto exec file. And there you go, you can see we're now in C colon backslash DOS. And it looks all nice. We can see where we are, we can see what DOS version we're in. I just find it nice and tidy and it takes a couple of seconds to do. So now what we're going to do is start copying the MS-DOS files off A drive onto the current folder. And I've got a bit of audio here for you guys. Hopefully you enjoy the sounds. Now I must say most of these tools I uh, almost never use. I think for my file management I usually mostly use X3 Gold back in the day or X3 Pro or something like that. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, flop, change flop, uh, floppy disks and we're just going to copy the second disk into the same folder. Now I hit control C there, which seems really weird, but in old version of DOS, uh, I think it was DOS 1, maybe DOS 2, it had no disk change, so it didn't know when you'd change the disk, and for speed it used to cache the current disk contents, so whenever you change disk, the idea was to hit control C. Um, don't need to do it with MS DOS 3, it was just something I did out of habit. Now the next thing I decided to do was install this serial card here. Um, it's got two ports, and one of the reasons I picked it actually is because it's got that little flying lead without the bracket, and I thought it'd be neat to actually use one of those for once. So you can see there next to where I'm installing the card, there's little holes for 25 pin connectors, so I thought I'd make use of one of those. So the installation is quite simple here. Um, I'm just going to undo those two little screw-in things on the side there. I just use a pair of pliers and my fingers, and it just winds them straight off. And it's quite simple. Now the other funny thing with serial cards is a lot of people will talk about things like IRQ and all that sort of stuff being a problem. It is, but quite often I find most of these cards are set up for COM1 and COM2, or they're already set up exactly as I need them, so I usually get lucky. And this is one of those situations where I got perfectly lucky and it, it was set up as COM1 and COM2. Um, and the lid just fell down on me there twice. It's annoying. Okay, let's go around the back and just tighten that up a little bit. Um, now I probably shouldn't have used pliers here. Um, if you screw a connector into it, it'll actually tighten those things up by himself. And the reason that I shouldn't be using pliers is I was a bit nervous I was going to scratch the case. Um, but I pulled it off without doing any damage. Lovely. And just see how clean that machine is. Now for this next process, I lost a lot of my footage. And I'm going to show you why that was in a second. Here it is here. You see I'm at 92% CPU. So I was doing a lot of capture um, through my Elgato software. Windows 10 was doing an update in the background. It didn't tell me about it. Elgato didn't tell me that it was losing a lot of frames. So I'm losing a lot of content, but this is what I've got. So this is my tween out. This is down there underneath the workbench now. So all I was doing is firing this up. Look over to it on the KVM. So I get it screen up on my workbench down there. And we're ready to go. And I've got a serial cable hooked up to that machine. And that comes up through the workbench, and I've got a DB25 connector to go on the back of my XT. 
So this is the remote um, bootstrap loading for fast links. This means I don't need to use a floppy disk to copy the program. And it's the main, use and main reason that I use a serial cable as opposed to parallel. Um, parallel is a lot faster, um, but I don't really need high speed when I'm doing this kind of thing. What I really want is the convenience of just being able to copy it across on the serial cable. Um, so I tend to use that. So let's actually see it do something useful now that we've actually got it started up and we've got a few games on it. I love the sound of these machines when they start up and those hard drive noises. But the hard drives in these aren't quite as noisy as a lot of people will tell you, but they do make a great noise nonetheless, instead of Space Quest here. That's enough of that theme song. Let me try something else. Let's try this. Give Alley Cat a go. Yep, that works a treat. Now, one thing here, and notice on the bottom right hand side of the screen there, you'll see it's a little bit discolored. For some reason, this machine has, or this monitor, has a lot of issues with um, uh, it was basically the static magnetic fields or whatever it is that causes that. I have run a degausser over it, and it's a lot better than it was. Um, but yeah, still got that discoloration. Don't forget to pack your drive. Now, I hope you enjoyed at least some of this video. I'll see you guys next time. Have a good one. Thanks.